it's a pleasure to connect with you again. And this is Earth Month. And a lot of people, when you speak with them, it's they're kind of dealing with stunts. They're doing their one time of the year. They're doing the Earth stuff. But I'm speaking to the co-founder of the Coalition of Sustainable Aquaculture. So it sounds like every month is Earth Month for you. Yeah, you know, and I, it, it's a great point that you make because we, we truly are in the middle of an existential crisis. Um, two years ago, when we started working on our natural history doc at my production company, and obviously I've been involved in these kind of issues for the last 20 years because chefs are at the intersection of health, wellness, immigration reform, uh, food waste, uh, you know, international economic development, international security. I mean, there's so many issues that chefs sit at the nexus of uh, because of their restaurants. Right. When I, you know, for the last 10 years, all we've heard is 2050, 2050. That's the date that we need to solve things by. Uh, then we had uh, SDGs and global accords that uh, moved that up to 2030. Um, now we're hearing that we're not going to make it by 2030. I, I, I can tell you, and, and this is just a horrible anecdote to share, um, but my panel at South by Southwest this year, along with some of the best climatologists in the world mm -hmm. and some of my colleagues from the United Nations World Food Program, uh, we did a, 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 it was a catchy title, right? Uh, I think it was, it was two and a half degrees from disaster, right? The idea being we can't grow our, our, our warmth on this planet by two and a half degrees. Um, so the, we named it, uh, we, we spoke the middle of March. We mm -hmm. named it in January was our deadline for for the actual name. You could sign up for the for the program, but the name I think we gave them in December or January, four four months beforehand. In those four months, uh, studies came out, and the first thing we had to do when we took the stage is our climatologist had to say, "Apologies, it's one and a half degrees to disaster." Oh, right geez. now, we didn't warm up a degree in those four months. But the point being is that the science is so exact. The science is so clear. Mm -hmm. The data is coming in, in droves from NGOs, governments, uh, corporations that are doing some incredible work on this, right? I mean, General Mills is probably the large, it, they were for years, they may not be now, I think they're number two, but is either the number one or two in, investor in drought resistant grain research because they make the most money in the world from cereal. Right. So it's in there, but they don't want to go the way of Kodak. They want to be, they want to still be selling <laughs> Cheerios in, in, in 15 years. So if they don't figure yeah. out drought resistant grain and how things are moving around. Um, so yeah, this is a nonstop uh, job for me. And I really truly believe that we need to spend as much time talking about what we're doing with our oceans, which no one is, as we have been talking about what happens on land, which has been our obsession for the last 30 years, um, especially in the social justice and equity space and in the public development space. Um, and the, the, the ocean, in many ways, like the Amazon jungle, holds the secrets uh, to our existence. So my point of view and it's the point of view of our documentary hope in the water and mm -hmm. it is it is the angle from which i approach everything in this work is that it's vitally important that we both protect our waterways and oceans rivers streams lakes everywhere and at the same time we have to produce out of it mm -hmm. Because we're not going to be able to feed a hungry planet that way we can't shut down the two billion people that you know, food out of the water is their main source of protein. We can't shut down the billion plus water. There's a lot that we don't know about. No one goes into small little villages in Cambodia and and adds fishermen who are on some of those floating uh, villages that are in Lake Tungle Sap and adds mm -hmm. them to the, to the total. But we have a billion and a half people who make their living on the water. Can't just shut that down. You can't shut down all the fisheries. You just can't it doesn't work that way. Right. And so what we need to do is we need to protect it. And we also need to produce out of it. And I think most people listening have all heard, you know, the story of the oyster, right? There's a perfect example of 
If you put an oyster farm in the water, the water becomes cleaner, the water becomes healthier, more fish come in, the fishing around it becomes better because oysters, mussels, clams are filter feeders, right? We now have real data on the no-take zones that are established, which, by the way, farmers have been doing for about, I don't know, 5,000 years, yeah. where you take a third of your land and let it be fallow for a year. Well, we found that in no-take zones, let them let those areas go fallow for three years. It increases production all around the no-take zones, right? So it's a mm -hmm. better managed fishery and it regenerates and attracts more fish when you reopen it than it ever had when you closed it. It's simple, 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 simple stuff. Right. I, I think I think what's interesting is, you know. Behavioral Science 101 teaches us that we will only we will only listen and change opinion and behavior based on how much we trust the communicator. So I think and we trust all, you. So well, it, it, you know, more important than me is the people who are on the water, right? That's why a storytelling doc of the type we're doing is so vitally important. Right. Well, taking things in a little bit of a different direction, you called out appearing recently at South by Southwest. The last time I spoke with you, that was on the heels of New York City wine and food. So you're one of those people who has a thousand jobs where sometimes you're the chef and restaurateur, sometimes the author, sometimes the TV host. There's the Coalition of Sustainable Aquaculture. How do you get this all done? Wow, that's a really good question. I'm not sure that I do. Probably because I'm a, a overly hyper responsible lunatic. Um, that's, probably the, that's probably the best reason. Um, I, I, you know, everyone, I mean, you hear all the time, right? We, you know, we, we all have to, you know, do better self care, right? Uh, I, I try that. I, I sleep, you know, I, right. I, I watch, you know, streamers and television just like the next person. Um, I walk my dogs. I do all the things that you know give me pleasure and joy. But but I didn't mention and sorry to I, cut you off. I didn't mention all your philanthropic efforts, where I know the sober community <laughs> is a big passion of yours. On top of all that stuff, so I really don't get. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm the global ambassador for the United Nations World Food Program, and I actually go do stuff for them. Yeah. I just got back from ten days in Zambia. Um, I'm, you know, on the board of the Africa Outreach Project that Charlize Theron founded and, and services for the underserved in New York. And, you know, it's the Nature Conservancy. I'm their ambassador and the International Rescue Committee working with refugees. I mean, this is vital work that needs to be done. And I was, I only bring that up not to pat myself on the back or show you how overextended I am, but to tell you that that's the great joy of my life. As, a, as someone who's been sober for 31 years, right. the, the key to my health and wellness and happiness is service work. The way I stay sober is service work. And a long time ago, one of my spiritual gurus in, in, in the program that I attend that helps me stay sober suggested that I do more service work outside of that group, that that was just as valid. And that was like letting you know, uh, you know, the tiger in the chicken house. I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. And I was off to the races, but I really do believe that this is vital work that needs to be done. And I'm a storyteller. I, I, I one of the meetings I had earlier today um, was with a business conclave at which, you know, CEOs from some of the biggest multinational energy companies are going to be there and huge Wall Street investment funds in San Francisco, uh, you know, hedge fund, all this, like a, a very heady world. And I'm sort of the entertainment after lunch for half an hour. And I'm just getting up there and I'm telling a story about my experience in Zambia. And it's, you know, anywhere that I can go tell a story and get people to start thinking in a different way to me is the most valuable thing that I can do. That's my superpower. So I don't go in there trying to, to, to do someone else's job. I go in there trying to inspire and get people to think about something in a way perhaps that they hadn't. Well said. Well, my last question of interest, and I don't know if that's this is going to yield a 10-minute answer or a two-second, no, no, not for me, uh, is people who are top chefs and restaurateurs in major cities like New York City often don't look towards 
the food that's 30 minutes outside of the city. I'm dialing in from a town on Long Island called Long Beach, Long Island. I'm curious if you've been around here or the food sure. scene of this area. Oh, you're familiar. Very much. Well, I'm a born and bred New Yorker and grew up on Long Island. So you're a Long Islander? I always thought because of your bio that you were a Minnesota person. I moved here 31 years ago. That's that's when, well, I was I was sent here 31 years ago and I loved it. And this community loved me up and, you right. know, taught me how to live. And I got sober here and stayed sober and stayed living here. Wow. Where on Long Island are you originally from? Well, we, we lived in the city. We had another home out on the South Fork. Ah, uh, the L.A. Part 2 that we call the Hamptons. That's that's correct. Although, it, it, you know, I, I, I will say it, it has become a joke of a TV show. It's right. become a, a cliche for many things that are wrong with the world. Having a, a, a family that's had homes out there since the 1940s, Oh. Um, and living there and understanding that, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't call myself a boniker, uh, but I'm 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 not that far removed uh, from it. And, you know, when you talk about food resource out there, let's talk about eels. Let's talk about small fish with the heads on them. Let's talk about seaweed. Let's talk about, you know, regenerative products from the from the waterways, um, which is why I'm desperately. Uh, desperately trying to tell those stories um, as well, because it's really important. You know, we, uh, you know, I think everybody knows that, you know, small fish with the heads on it uh, are, you know, generate faster, they're closer to shore, they're easier to catch. Why we're not eating more of them is, is crazy to me. Everyone loves Italian food. Yeah. Yes, you go over there and they do have a local swordfish in that part of the world. They do have a local tuna in that part of the world. So you will get a piece seared and it's usually about four or five ounces. It's small. It's surrounded by a lot of other stuff. It's also hyper seasonal. But most of the time, anywhere you're coastal, you're eating a bunch of small little fish. Everyone says, oh, that's so wonderful. Well, why not do that at home, right? stop eating uh you know uh the 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 big four that are consumed here mm -hmm. right in, in in our part of the world you know with 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 shrimp and salmon and you know tuna and halibut and you know it's it's we need to start eating the way the rest of the world eats which is a more sustainable model you go down to central america the islands parts of south america everyone gets a 2 pound snapper on the bone you know, fried, baked, broiled, grilled, however it is, whatever country, right. and the heads are taken back and you make a stew with it. And then it, it is a regenerative system. We can do the same thing with foods from, you know, the, the, the city and environs. And when it comes to seaweed, we talked about bivalves uh, and shellfish cleaning up the water. You know, seaweed sequesters more carbon than trees do. You know, and they're phenomenal. It's probably the healthiest food that you can eat for yourself. High in protein, glucosamine, chondroitin, gelatin, soup. It's it's a superfood. The a, a vast majority of seaweed is used uh, in this country uh, for export, and what isn't exported is used for cosmetics. Oh. And I think we need to understand, and I think that's great for for a simple reason. I support American fishermen. But we have to stop exporting and start consuming here in America these products. And I think that's a vitally uh, important piece of the puzzle. Chefs are the tip of the spear. Chefs are trying to push this stuff out to people. And I hope that continues for a long time. Well, thank you for your time. And I hope you win that Webby Award. I've been following the Instagram campaign and it seems I like- I got no shot. I got no shot. The, the, the <laughs> leader is the raccoon. Uh, the raccoon video is in first place by like 8 million votes, uh, but coming in second to a fuzzy animal uh, video series is kind of like winning. In the human being category, I'm winning. Yeah, number one I, human. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, this it's, it's funny that you bring that up because, you know, life's not about awards, right? Life is about, you know, making the world better for other people. Mm -hmm. And doing that, other people are making the world better for you.
right? I mean, I have all the faith in the world that if I'm doing good works over here, someone's doing good works over there that benefit my family uh, and myself. You can't fight every fight. But in doing little things like the knife skills video, trying to get more people into the kitchen, and you know, we we cook some things in that video that are aligned with the stuff that we're talking about, and I think there's tremendous value uh, in that. So you try to insert that messaging everywhere that you can, mm -hmm. and you're doing it. Well, I'm looking forward to the next book, the next documentary, the next TV show, et cetera, and really do appreciate your time, and really do hope you win that Webby. <laughs> as the number one human or the number one I, I hope so I, it would be very nice for the for the the team that made it i just showed up and talked <laughs> thanks andrew have a great rest of the day best Take of luck care. bye bye